Welcome to the Korea Society. My name is Jayo. I'm the Arts and Culture Director here. Um, and tonight we have what I what I promised everybody to be a fun night, um, hopefully a slightly a boozy night. Um, we call it the Korean Soul 101. So I know you guys are all here to for the tasting, but we are calling it 101, so we do have to talk a little bit. Um, so hope you hope you bear with with us. Um, but I have two experts here to talk about Korean soul, um, makgeolli and soju in general, uh, in particular. So we have Daniel Lee of West 32 Soju and Alice Chun of Hana Makgeolli. Expert is in quotes <laughs> for me. So. Yes. So welcome to the Korea Society. Thank, Thank you so you. much for joining us tonight. Thank so you. let's, since we are calling it 101, let's start with the very basic. Okay. Um, soju and makgeolli, we said in our um, introduction, we said um, soju and makgeolli are probably the most well-known traditional liquor, sort of the signature liquors of um, Korea. So what is exactly soju and what is exactly makgeolli? Want to start, Daniel? Sure. Um, soju, uh, so actually this comes as a surprise to a lot of people, um, even Korean people who have drink, been drinking soju for the better part of their adult lives, but soju is basically just a term that means distilled liquor. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically the same word as vodka in Russian, um, so there's nothing really too special about it. It's not like champagne where it has to meet certain parameters. Um, it can be distilled from pretty much anything. Um, and it's, so it's, it's just the Korean term for distilled liquor. Right. And then a lot of the soju that people are familiar with these days that comes in the green bottle, it's actually not just distilled, it's diluted as well, correct? Right. And so um, so it, it is, it's called diluted, but it is still uh, using a distilled base. Mm -hmm. um, but Korean uh, soju, which have become very popular, are um, usually just, they're diluted. They, they purchase a bulk ethanol from... Right. Um, other suppliers, and then they'll just add other ingredients, sweeteners and preservatives. Mm -hmm. um, and then lately, the alcohol percentage has also been coming down. Right, because when soju actually first started, or as far as we know, it was pretty strong liquor. Yeah. <laughs> and not as strong as vodka, but usually... Well, actually, hist historically, soju huh. also was um, pretty, pretty much as, yeah. at just 40%. Um, up to uh, you know north of fifty percent. Right. Um, it's 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 very recent that it's actually been um, it's less than twenty percent now. Now right. it's, it's less than seventeen percent. Now yeah. it's, it's some of them are even less than fifteen percent. Yeah, less and a lot of that has to do with uh, marketability factor right. in business, making it trying to widen the, mm -hmm. the audience as much as possible. And what about makgeolli? Um, so I have a little so the. The t difference between Daniel and I is that, um, I mean, obviously we're both making Korean sewers, but I tend to be like this historical or artisanal geek. So I'm going to add a little bit of flavor to that. Um, so makgeolli is a, essentially, by definition, um, a Korean wine, right, or a Korean rice wine um, that contains rice sediment. Um, makgeolli literally translates to carelessly filtered thing. Um, I mean, although it translates to carelessly filtered thing, it, it doesn't have to necessarily be a carelessly made product. It can be quite beautiful. Um, the rice sediment that it passes through um, gives it that white creamy color um, that settles when it, the bottle is resting and that is shaken up before serving. Um, I think, though, for, you know, if you're looking at Korean sewers from like a traditional perspective or this artisanal perspective, um, by definition, um, it can be made with a multitude of, dif uh, of different starches, but typically Korean sous are made with rice. Um, the definition of rice, though, can be quite broad, right? You can be using sweet rice, you can be using medium grain rice, you can be using various different kinds of rice. Um, and then there's also something called nuruk, which is a unique fermentation starter that is, um, that, is that kind of defines, you know, is this Korean suit or not, right? And Korean, nuruk is a wheat-based inoculate that contains, like, very special wild yeast, wild bacteria that create that Korean suit. So, yeah, by definition, that's what makgeolli is. And makgeolli is fermented, yes. right? So there are some wild speculations that it's actually good for you. <laughs> Anything that's fermented these days seems to have that connotation of healthy, but obviously 
it's also alcohol. But although the proof of it is a lot more than I, you know, normally thought. Well, I mean, kind of like Daniel was mentioning, how there's a huge range in terms of ABV, in terms of ingredients, in terms of distilling methods within soju. It's the same within Korean makgeolli. Um, so one, the health, like um, the health aspect. There could be health aspects, but obviously it depends on how it's made. Right. One, you know, what kind of starches were used? How processed were they? Right. Two, you know, what kind of fermentation starter um, was used to do the conduct the fermentation? And three, after filtration, was it pasteurized? Was it stabilized? Were there other preservatives used in it? For Hana Makgeolli, um, so for Hana Makgeolli, we don't pasteurize. Right. We're using nuduk, which contains a lot of lactic bacteria, um, wild yeast, wild bacteria that are, that can be good for your gut. Um, it's questionable. So we produce between 12 and 16 percent ABV, which is actually quite high for a makgeolli. Normally, the commercial, um, commercially available makgeollis are around 6 percent. It's questionable whether probiotics <laughs> cultures can survive at you know 16 percent ABV. But you know, I can personally say it is quite soothing to the stomach. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the history a little bit. When did Koreans actually start drinking? you know, what we now know as soju or makgeolli or whatever it was the uh, former stage of what is now known as soju and makgeolli. Do you know, like... Yeah, I can answer that if you... Um, well, for mm -hmm. soju, oh, do you want to start with makgeolli? No. Makgeolli is a lot older, so... You... Okay, um, so, you know, documented history for Korean sewers go back to the Koguryo dynasty. Um, but, you know... Even though it's not documented, historians have found evidence that rice-based alcohols, they, they, there's stories about how, like, um, that are originate from, you know, Africa, where people would chew rice and spit it out and let it ferment, right? So can you consider that makgeolli? Like, sure, right? If, if you filtered it, kind of slight semi-filtered it, um, and, you know, drank it with its sediment, sure, you can consider that makgeolli, but... Um, there is doc the documented history for um, makgeollis and just sewers overall start in the Kokuryo dynasty. Yeah, and soju, um, I, I think there's a lot of kind of uh, back and forth between the actual mm -hmm. history, but it's widely believed that it originated sometime in the 1200s. Um, and it's also widely believed that it came from uh, the Mongols who brought it to Korea, right. who... Um, and the Mongols, it's theorized that they got it from the Persians. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the Persian drink or their distilled beverage was called arak. Mm -hmm. And so in Korea, there are still some places that they call it soju arak. arakju. Um, I haven't confirmed that myself in Korea, but apparently that's true according <laughs> to Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and so, and then, um, and andong soju is also considered kind of like the historical Right. version of soju today mm -hmm. um, and so there's evidence that points to the fact that the Persians had had a military base in Andong at the time when yeah. when Andong soju became popular in Korea and so the origins go back to um, probably around 12 mid 1200s mm -hmm. and I just realized um, just for everyone that doesn't you know know anything about Korean sewers makgeolli or fermented makgeolli is distilled into soju I don't know if that was clear Mm -hmm. um, so it is the base. Um, sur as a category all kind of build on within um, one another, the varieties of sur, that is. Right. So yeah. if you don't distill it and then just let it ferment, then it becomes makgeolli. And then if you... Well, you have to make it make makgeolli it, first. Right. Yeah. And then right. you and then, actually more and then right. distill it. Yeah. Right. So, and then, but the rapid sort of the image that we have of soju and makgeolli is that it's everybody's drinks. It's... Yeah. It's not the most, how should I say it? It's not the most exclusive drinks. Mm -hmm. Everybody can drink it. Um, you hear all the stories of people who used to make soju or makgeolli at home. You hear the stories even until in the 80s, like every little village would have their lit own little makgeolli house where you can go. And instead of buying it from supermarket or anything, you go to your local pub, I guess, for lack of better words, and, you know, get a... a little kettle full of makgeolli. So what do you think? I mean, do you think that's true? I know, and I know you guys always talk about there's always a different variations and um, within the same category, but that seems to be definitely the image of soju and makgeolli when you think about it. 
Um, what do you think of that? Yeah, I know for a fact that my parents and um, my uncles and aunts, they, they actually made makgeolli at home mm -hmm. in, you know, decades ago when they mm -hmm. lived in Korea. Mm -hmm. um, as for the image of soju, I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it, it is, is presented as a social lubricant, and that's definitely, I think that is true. Um, going back to your question about the health aspects of makgeolli, I, you know, I don't think that really applies to soju, um, but because it is a social drink, it, it, I think it is something that, um, Korean people historically have used as something to um, use for celebrations or even, you know, on the other end of the spectrum for um, if they're mourning. And it is also incredibly cheap, right? That's also, yeah, probably one of the top factors for why right. it's so widely consumed. Mm -hmm. And how about makgeolli? I mean, you know, the image that I have of makgeolli is like you hear all these stories of the farmers, you know, because it's made out of rice and it fills your stomach. Um you know, it's kind of the thing that you right. drink while you're working, right. you know, that sort of story. Right. So that is the case for makgeolli. Historically, it was known as the farmer's drink. A bowl of makgeolli would essentially be a substitution or a substitute for a bowl of rice. Um, it fuels you while you're working, you know, it, it, <laughs> so it, it gives a, it has that effect as well. Um, but Again, going back to what Kana Jay was saying, you know, it really depends on the variety in terms of accessibility of makgeolli if you look at it traditionally or, or historically. Um, within Sur, right, there's makgeolli, and then once that rice sediment settles, there's yakju or chongju. It's the clarified stuff at the top. That's kind of equivalent to what we know as sake in, in, in Japanese alcohols. Um, then there's like kwahaju, which is fortified alcohols. Um, there's uh, infused alcohols that are kind of used as like medicinal for medicinal purposes. Um, and you know, if you look at the layers of a wonju, that's what we call like the fermented byproduct as a whole. Um, the top, the clear chongju or the yakju, is typically saved for nobility or of people of higher economic or social status back in the day. Right, and then the makgeolli or the takju was watered down to make makgeolli to give to the farmers. Um, so there is a social stratification in terms of what parts of the sur that you drink, um, and then also you know you have to look at like historical events, right? Um, war, famine, occupation, all of these things, um, they completely changed a, a generation's understanding of Korean sur. Um, so what? This modern day people, you know, our mothers and fathers and maybe their grand, our grandparents, um, what they understand as Korean sur, as this like accessible, you know, wicked hangover, social lubricant drink, um, is pretty much a modern definition. Um, Just like anything different. Oh, in yeah, Korea with, with, with the that. industrialization, right. you know, that started in the 60s. Exactly. And then you started having soju or makgeolli being produced by big factories, and as you said, it's mostly by dilution of yeah. you know yeah. buying bulk ethanol and then mixing it with the water. And actually, the '60s—it's funny you bring that up because that's actually when the process of soju becoming what we know as soju as a lower ABV soju started. Mm -hmm. Because there was, um, I think it was in 1965, there was um, a prohibition in terms of using rice right. as the main grain mm -hmm. for distilling soju. Mm -hmm. um, and so they started going to things like sweet potatoes, potatoes. Mm -hmm. um, tapioca these days. Tapioca yeah. is today's soju. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, but tapioca is it's the cheapest used. type of starch, and that is that is what's used in today's soju, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about just the image of, you know, going along with that idea of... Um, image of drinks in Korean culture, especially with soju. We were just joking a little bit today. Um, there, I don't think there is a single K-drama that does not involve a scene where somebody is crying because of broken heart and getting really, really drunk with, you know, eight bottles of green bottles and finishing another bottle or, you know, a scene of a bunch of businessmen going out together and doing all this. So what do you think of that perpetu perpetuates that image of that soju as this either, um, you know, broken heart, let's get just really, really drunk kind yeah. of thing, or sort of that, as you said, social lubricant? type of thing? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, when you do see the image of the crying 
you know, girlfriend who whatever happened with bottles of soju. I think that really also is related to the fact that it is a social lubricant because on the good and positive end of the spectrum, it's something that's used for celebration and people just want to drink. You don't need to hold back on it. It's not a expensive um, distilled right. liquor where you have to sip mm -hmm. it. It's something that you, you can just kind of kind of drink and celebrate. But then it's, I think it's, it's related because on the other end of the spectrum, it's kind of the same thing, but on the other end where it's also a social experience where, because usually when they are sad and crying and there's always someone else on the other side of the table kind of <laughs> making them feel better. Right. And so it's, it's, an, it's also part of that social um, aspect, but mm -hmm. it's, it's just on the other end of the spectrum, I think. Yeah, fun fact, Koreans outdrink the Russians <laughs> and it's probably because we never drink alone. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. But speaking of the bad reputation, Makali does have that yeah. reputation yeah. as giving you the most wicked the hangover, hangover, even though um, it's not really strong, per se, in right. terms of the so, alcohol. Um, with Makali, right? I mean, I guess you can equate it to like what people know with um, in terms of hangovers in association with wine, right? It really depends on the quality of the wine, how it was treated, how it was made. So um, Makoli's today, like commercially Makoli, um, that is available is around 4 to 6% ABV. It has added sugars. If it's not added sugars, add like, um, added like, um, like aspartame and other sugar alternatives. Um, in addition to that, there's all kinds of flavoring in there. Um, and so it really depends on how it's made. Like those chemicals, when you enter your body or, or when you consume them and you consume them in large volumes, of course you're going to get a hangover, right? The preservatives, the sugars, that combination is, you know, a wicked combo. Um, but for artisanal makolis, um, things that are made, you know, using longer firm times to make sure that there's very little residual sugar left in the brew, um, things that are not treated with sulfites or other preservatives, um, definitely no flavoring and minimal amounts of sugar, if none, right? That actually, tr the effect is more like when you drink a natural wine. There really is no hangover, no matter how much you drink. Um, something and, I'm very I would have to add, though, that the reputation of the nasty hangover is not just isolated to Korean yeah, it's true. <laughs> Because I think if any of you have drank enough green bottle soju from Korea, <laughs> you wake up the next morning with just a very different type of hangover. Um, I know a lot of expats in Korea who, uh, you know, they're Americans who are now in Korea, and they call soju a hangover in a bottle mm. um, because it just gives you that different type of hangover, and it's for the same reasons. There's a lot of additives and preservatives, mm -hmm. sweeteners that are added that have a really bad effect to, mm -hmm. on your body. And that actually brings us to the point where in recent decade, in both in Korea and the United States, there has been a real rise of artisanal makgeolli and soju. Um, and, you know, you two are, you know, definitely part of that trend. So I want to just ask you a little bit about yourselves, too, because both of you grew up in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to find out how you two were introduced to Korean soul and what, other than they tasted really good, what really made you become interested in Korean soul and that became your vocation, actually, your calling even. Sure. Would you, um, yeah, so I guess um, I'll start. Uh, so I was introduced to Soju at um, a pretty young age. We want to get into the exact, <laughs> but uh, you know, so, so I've been drinking Soju for quite a number of years. Um, and really the whole concept behind West 32 Soju, um, it's called West 32 Soju because, uh, so my, my, um, business partner and friend, Maxwell Fine and I, we spent a lot of time on West 32nd street drinking a lot of Soju. Uh, so we, I, I moved, um, to New York, um, around 2007 and Max also, um, came to New York city around the same time we went to college together and, um, our experience with soju was very positive. You know, when we were in our 20s, it was very easy to recover the next day. No problem. <laughs> but as we crossed over into our 30s, approaching our mid-30s, it just, you know, it started getting a little bit, a little bit harder. Um, and so it got to the point where we just, you know, we were drinking soju pretty regularly. We did some research. 
um, just a, literally just a quick Google search. And we were like, why, uh, why does, number one, why is Soju so, was Soju so cheap? Mm -hmm. And why does it give you such a bad hangover? Mm -hmm. And that's the first time I actually learned that Korean Soju had this reputation of having all of these additives and preservatives right. that give you um, this nasty hangover the next day. Mm -hmm. um, and that was in October of 2014 that we discovered that because that was the same day where I literally said to my friend, why don't we make our own soju not like that? And that's literally how the idea was born. Right. And so when was when did you find the company? How long has so, it been? Um, so that discussion took place in 2014, October. And uh, from that point, we just, we just went on a mission to learn as much about the distilling process as possible. Um, when we were developing West 32 soju, we tried all the different types of bases, rice, um, sweet potatoes, potatoes, barley, wheat. Um, and one of the things, so we, we made, we decided to uh, make our product out of corn because one of the things that uh, we really wanted to preserve in our branding was the fact that we, I am a Korean American, I, I grew up here, and this is a, um, it's an American spirit based on a tra traditionally Korean spirit. And so we wanted to preserve that Korean American um, identity with um, our product. And so we decided to go with corn that's based in, um, grown out in North America. Um, and we wanted to, at the same time, preserve that kind of social essence of soju mm -hmm. um, as an, an affordable uh, social lubricant, mm -hmm. basically. And what has been the biggest challenge in terms of spreading the word about your soju? Yeah, so um, the biggest challenge definitely has been uh, li literally that, just getting the word out there, um, because it is just myself and my business partner. Um, we, we do very little in terms of paid marketing and things like that, and so it's literally just feet on the street effort to get our branding out there. Um, and then secondarily, I think it's um, educating people on what mm -hmm. soju is. Uh, most people who have never seen or tried soju, they look at our bottle, and even though it says soju on the bottle, they go, oh, sake. And I say, no, it's, it's, it's soju. It's, no, and, then, and then the next question is, what's soju? Um, and so the fact that uh, Korean culture is becoming more popular in the United States is certainly um, accelerating that process a little mm -hmm. bit. And so I'm noticing a lot more people are knowledgeable about what soju is, and they've mm -hmm. tried it before. Um, but that, that certainly is a challenge right now. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Alice? How what made you become really interested in makgeolli? Sure. Um, so makgeolli, I had a very hands-on dad. He taught me how to, you know, change the oil in the car, change the tires, go camping, build a fire, and make booze. Um, so home brewing was something that we did, um, and it was specifically makgeolli um, that we made together. Um, I would help, you know, wash the rice you know, spread it out after it's steamed, put it in the ongi. So it was like this activity that we did together. Um, and then growing up, you know, I, I was more interested in fermentation as, you know, a concept as a whole because fermentation, it's not just with alcohol, but in Korean culture, it, it's all across our cuisine, right? Um, so became kind of obsessed with it. And then in college, you know, once I moved over here to New York, I started brewing by myself. Um, and I was taking what my dad taught me and um, his recipe, which was literally like this much rice, this much water. Like it wasn't weighed out. I didn't even know what yeast did at the time. Um, I started making it on my own. And then kind of through experimentation um, and also just self-education, like literally Google, my savior, um, was able to start adjusting the recipe um, to make my own style and adapt it to my own taste. Um, the, the funny thing, I mean, in the context of this conversation, um, is that my understanding of makgeolli, or just Korean sous in general, was never green bottle soju or like green bottle makgeolli. It was always this like super harsh, like punch you in the face, like a lot of different flavors thing. So that was what my understanding of Korean Su was. It definitely influenced my taste in overall in terms of like drinking preferences, right? You know, like whiskey over a cocktail, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then I started making the makgeolli, um, was very shy about it. My friends encouraged me to share it. And then I st decided to put some branding around it. You know, my other side of me is I'm a consultant, so I can't put things out there 
like unpackaged or unfinished. So I made the Hanamakali brand. I was kind of throwing these like unofficial parties where I was sharing our, my home brews with people. Um, and then that rolled into like an educational event at the UN. And like people were just like, you know, wanting to do more collaborations and events together. And um, that was kind of, that was in like what, 2016? Um, and during that time, I didn't know it then, but it was market validation, right? And market research. I realized that actually, you know, one, people really do like the makgeolli that I make, and two, a lot of people know about it, and if not, they're very curious about it, right? Um, and that's kind of how Hana Makgeolli was born. I met my business partner um, through one of those events, John. He's sitting over there. Um, and um, we got together, and we decided, you know, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it big, um, and we're going to try to set up, you know, a, a, the first artisanal Korean makgeolli brewery here in the U.S. Um, and so now we're in the process of actually building out said brewery um, in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. It's primarily a production center, but there's going to be a small tasting room as well. Um, and I think, you know, the mission here, right, is to show people actually Korean sur, I mean makgeolli, but Korean sur can be much more complex and much more um, beautiful in that way, right, than, you know, people understand it today. Um, makgeolli, I mean, specifically makgeolli, um, in terms of imports, right, it is quite limited. You can find it at H Mart and stuff like that. But, you know, if you go to like Minnesota, or will you be able to find it there? No. Um, however, you know, like kind of Daniel was saying, um, the growth of, first of all, the rise of rice-based alcohols, right, to, um, you know, the proliferation of Korean culture and a general, a general understanding of Korean culture throughout the U.S., those are some of the reasons and indicators that we go on that we think um, will make Hanamakali a success. Thank you so much, Alice and Thank Danielle. You. Thank you. Thank you. And in the gallery, we have our new exhibition by um, Korean photographer Sungu Kim. As you can see, it's called Better Days. Um, it's about how Koreans um, spend their holidays. And I hope you find them interesting. So we'll see you in the, t in the gallery. Mm -hmm.